Hi, welcome to part three of my series on the OpenAI Assistance API. Today, we're going to be talking about how to use Code Interpreter so your LLM can do mathematics and crunch numbers. So if you haven't seen it already, part one is about information retrieval, part two is about function calling, and today we're going to focus on Code Interpreter. And these are the three main kind of tools that the Assistance API can call. A lot of people think that LLMs can't do math very well, and they would be correct. However, the Assistance API gives the LLM some superpowers in this regard. The LLM, based on the user message, can detect whether it needs some help on the mathematics. And if it does, it will call the code interpreter tool, which will enable the LLM to write code for itself to crunch numbers. And so in this way, it's able to overcome one of LLM's big deficiencies. And today, we're going to see exactly how that's going to work. It would be weird for me to do this video without at least acknowledging the craziness over the past few days with the organizational and leadership issues at OpenAI. Some people are starting to wonder whether they need to swap out their underlying foundation model or move to a more stable service provider. I think as a first move, it's probably sensible to make sure that whatever code you're working on runs on the uh, uh, Azure OAI services. So these should be the same LLMs that you're getting through OpenAI, except it's all sitting on Azure infrastructure. So it should be resilient to any potential disruptions on the OpenAI side. I will do a follow-up video on how to do this, so click subscribe if you want to be able to see that when it comes out. So without further ado, we're going to jump straight into the code. If you've seen part one and part two of this Assistance API video, you will be familiar with some parts of this code, so I'm not going to rehash it. Step one, we're going to create our assistant, and I'm going to call out how this is different from the previous two videos. So here, we're calling the Assistance API to create and the name of our assistant is going to be real estate calculator. The instructions, your tool that can estimate the price of a house when given the square footage, number of bedrooms, and neighborhood. Your estimates should be based exclusively on the data provided by the user. If no data is provided, you should ask the user for it. Please use a simple method to do this estimation. For example, by calculating the average price per square foot for a similar house. And we define the model, and this is where uh, it's different from the previous two videos. Instead of passing it the retrieval tool or uh, custom functions, we're passing it type of tool called code interpreter. And, uh, and then if we run this, it will create the assistant with the assistant ID here. Next step is that we create an empty thread and we'll print out the thread ID here. Step three is that we will add a user message to the thread. And here you can see that before we add the user message, we're actually uploading two files here because along with the first user message, we want to be able to give it two files for reference. It's called east.csv and west .csv, and here we're uploading it to OpenAI and getting the file IDs back. Oh, and basically storing it in this file ID array. Here we're writing our first user message to the thread that we just created, and we're saying use the data in the attached files to estimate the price of a house with three rooms, a thousand square feet in the east neighborhood. Please do the same for a similar house in the West neighborhood. We're asking it for two price estimates. And what we're also doing is under this files ID, passing it an array called file ID array. And 
Essentially, this file ID array contains the file IDs of the two files that we just uploaded here. Okay, so after we've done this, we will execute a run on that thread. Once we've kicked off the run operation, we will poll the run to get a status. So if it's still in progress or queued, then we wait 10 seconds and then poll it again. So basically keep polling until it's um, out of the in progress status, aka completed. In the next step, we will take retrieve all the messages from the thread as a list. And here we're looping through the messages and printing them out. And you'll see I've got here reversed. It just means that the, the way I've printed out the message here is in chronological order. This, this message right at the top is the first message that we passed to the API. So here we're saying use the data in the attached files to estimate the house prices. And the assistant wrote us one, two, three, four messages. So it says, it seems like there was an error in attempting to read the files. I'll try a different approach to handle the files one at a time and check their contents to proceed with the house price estimation. Let's start by examining the contents of the first file. I will try to read it as a CSV. If that fails, I'll try to identify the format and load it accordingly. Actually, I realized that I just forgot to show you what the files contain. They're very simple. So I'll show you. There, there are two files, east and west. So east only includes this part highlighted here. So at the top, we've got a title that says neighborhood east. And then we've got a list of houses. We've got the price, the square footage, and the number of rooms. And likewise, on the west sheet, the top says neighborhood west. We've got four houses here, the prices, square footage, and rooms. We're hoping that the assistance API will be able to draw on these two CSV files to answer the questions that we've sent it. Okay, so we were here, uh, so it's going to try and read the CSV, and then it's come back and said, both files have been successfully loaded as CSV files. The files appear to contain house price data for neighborhoods labeled east and west. Each data set contains a column for house price, square footage, and number of rooms. Before we can estimate the price of a house with the specified features, we need to clean up the data and extract the relevant columns to work with. Let's proceed by cleaning up the data and selecting the necessary columns for our estimation. And here it did something, and it wrote another message back to us. The data has been cleaned and is now ready for use. Each data set contains the information on houses from their respective neighborhoods with fields for house index not necessary for estimation, price, square footage, and a number of rooms. Next, I will estimate the price of a house with three bedrooms, a thousand square feet located in the east neighborhood, as well as for a similar house in the west neighborhood. For each neighborhood, I will calculate the average price per square foot for houses with three bedrooms and use that rate to estimate the price of the specified house. The estimated price for a house with three bedrooms and a thousand square feet in the east neighborhood is approximately $56,000. In the west neighborhood, the estimated price for a similar house is approximately $82,000. So if we go back to our spreadsheet here, if we look at east, we do a sum of all the prices of houses that have three rooms, and it's a sum of the square footage, so we take the average per square footage price, multiply that by a thousand, and the answer that GPT gave us is correct, it's 56,000. And likewise, for West, it is also, you know, we, there's only one house with three rooms, so we just took that per square footage rate, multiplied it by a thousand to get 82,000. And if we just go back here, those numbers are correct. If we just look at the threads messages, we actually don't really know what's going on under the hood. Like, how did it do all of this? So here, in step eight, we're going to retrieve this thing called 
run steps as a list. And we're going to, with this next cell, print it out. And there's quite a bit of code here. It's just to parse out the run steps. The run steps give you the details as to how code interpreter is being used on the back end. When you call this run steps list, it returns an object, which is in quite a complicated format. I'm going to show you what it looks like in a sec. And so this code is really just to loop through each of the run steps and then to parse out the information and then to print it to screen so we can see it more clearly. But let me just switch over here so you can see what that run step object looks like. So it returns something called a sync cursor page and within it is a data and the data under data is an array and in this array there are a number of run step objects and within each run step object you have a number of attributes like the ID, the assistance ID, cancelled at, created at, blah 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 the really important one is the type. So at this run step, did it create a message? Oh. Did it call a tool? And if it called a tool, what kind of tool did it call? And there are three types. There's retrieval, there's function, and there's code interpreter. If it did call one of these tool calls, you'll see in the step details that there'll be a whole bunch of detail in here, if the type is code interpreter, you'll see what kind of code it wrote and ran and what output it got from it. So now we're going to switch back to our code and see what actually happened behind the scenes. So in step, in the run step number one, what it did was did a tool call. And in this tool call, you'll see that it wrote some code to read in the CSV files that we gave it. In the run step two, it wrote a message out to the thread. In step three, it did another tool call. And the tool call, uh, the code interpreter, and the code that it wrote is this. So it's trying to read the first data file. It's using the pandas library to read CSV. And then it read, read the first file, and read the second file, and returned the data. And as an output, it has logged that it has su successfully read those two files. And so I think that's the information that GPT took to write us this message. Both files have been successfully loaded as CSV files. All right, let's go back down. Okay, so run step four. Run step four, it wrote a message, and that was the message that we just looked at. Run step five. It did another tool call. Again, it ca called tool a code interpreter. And let's have a look at this code here. What it's doing here is cleaning up the files. So it's dropping some of the columns that it doesn't need. It's changing some of the data types to numeric. And then it's passed its output the cleaned up version of the data. And in run step six, you can see that it's outputted another message. Let's just scroll back to see which message that corresponds with. Yeah, that's probably this one. The data has been cleaned and is now ready for use. Okay, so now we're at step seven. It did another tool call. Again, it's a code interpreter. And here, this is where it's finally doing the calculations with the clean data. So first, it filtered 
the data in each of the files so it's only working with houses with three rooms and then here you can see that it's done what what we did on the spreadsheet which is took the sum of all the prices and the sum of all the square footage and did a division to figure out the per square footage price for the east neighborhood and the west neighborhood correspondingly and it's put our input specifications here and then finally it's calculated the estimated price by taking the square footage price for each of the neighborhoods and multiplying it by our specified square footage. Here you can see that the LLM even though inherently doesn't know how to do mathematics. It knows how to write code, so it wrote code that enables it to do mathematics, which is very cool. And finally, step eight, it did another message creation to output the final results to us. So that's how Code Interpreter works. Oh, um, by the way, a lot of people in my last two videos have asked me for the code and I'm perfectly happy to share it. But there was somebody who took my entire video, including my drawings and my code, and created a complete copycat video of everything. So it's just making me think, how can I share my code in a way where my videos don't get ripped off? If any of you guys have ideas, please uh, leave me a comment and give me some suggestions.